about how is your latest book doing, X plus Y? Um, yes, my latest book has come out in the UK and it will soon be out in the US. I'm not sure when this is, is going to be uh, published, this, this interview, but it's my answers and my theory about gender issues in mathematics and beyond, because it's not just in math that we have questions about gender representation, it's in practically every part of the world, in fact. And because I am a woman in the male-dominated field of math, I've been asked about this for a really long time. And for years, I just didn't want to talk about it. And I think that that's often the case with, with women and other minorities when they're junior, because it can be very, um, it can feel dangerous when you don't feel secure. And eventually, I just didn't want to draw attention to the fact that I was a woman. And eventually I felt more secure and I wanted to talk about it. And now I realize it's really important to talk about it. And because I have some kind of voice and because I have some security and stability, it's really important for me to talk about it on behalf of people who do not have that voice. And the book draws on my experience as a mathematician in this very male dominated field, but it also draws on my discipline as a pure mathematician. And one of the things that we do in pure mathematics is that we look at patterns between situations and we theorize about them and we often make a new theory that brings together different concepts that we've noticed happening and we and and we often well i'm an I, my my research is in higher dimensional category theory and so i always love the fact that if you go into a higher dimension you can often see things with more nuance and more clearly and it's it's it relates to what we were saying about about weight and a volume actually because because weight we said is a pretty decent proxy for mass because gravity doesn't change and i think what we've been doing with gender is that we have been trying to use gender as a proxy for human behavior and so we say that men do this and women do that and we call it masculine and feminine behavior and then we try to associate that with things like mathematical ability. And so there's an awful lot of people trying to claim that, oh, well, there's a difference between male mathematical ability and female mathematical ability, and that that will somehow account for the overrepresentation of men in mathematics. So what I say is that gender just isn't a very good proxy for behavior, and that we, it will be illuminating if we get out of that one-dimensional gender um, the one dimensional thinking of just thinking that gender is male to female, masculine to feminine behavior and go, well, why don't we just think about behavior with a separate dimension? And instead of saying, are men better at math than women? Why don't we just say, what makes someone good at math? And, uh, and consider whether we are nurturing that and whether we are successfully finding it. And I think we're not. I think that that typical math education in school and indeed at university doesn't nurture the same kind of math that is then good for research because it's all about exams and tests and rules and speed rather than research which is about depth and it's about making connections between things and it's less about getting the right answer and more about building arguments and creating theories and about collaborating with people and certainly in pure math, there is much less of the big race to get the answer first. And there might still be some of that in, in more in experimental science. But in math, it's about, in pure math, it's about thinking deeply about things and working together and pooling our knowledge. And so I think that we're, we're filtering for the, for the wrong things. And so one of the main things I do in the book is, is talk about how we're filtering for the wrong things and propose new terminology to a, to make a new dimension so that we can study behavior and try and disassociate it from gender. And so I introduce words ingressive and Ingressory. congressive instead of trying to talk about things for men and things for women. And so ingressive is to signal going into things and, and being an it, sort of individualistic and thinking about yourself. And congressive is about bringing things together, which is what I think is sometimes associated with women, but it's very, it's obstructive to say that because then men get upset and because many men do that too and not all women do that and then we have to put all these caveats in all over the place and it can sound like i'm just trying to make a new dichotomy between people and the thing is that if we disassociate it from gender we can understand that these are not things that are innate 
these are things we can learn and that society puts pressure on us to behave in a certain way, especially American society, which is particularly aggressive and competitive and values individualism. And we see these tensions in the world at the moment with the pandemic between people who, who think that they should make their own decisions about themselves and not take into account other people and other people who think that we need to work as a society to sort this out. It's not just every person for themselves. So this theory, although it started as something to do with my experience of math, it expanded like many mathematical theories do to, to help me understand not just um, how to filter people in for research, but how to have better interactions at a personal level with, with humans so that we don't get into adversarial conversations like we almost did at the beginning of the conversation about say, oh, the US is behind. Well, <laughs> let's just try to think about the pros and cons instead. And I think that this can help with teaching. If we can make more congressive classrooms, that it can, it's more inclusive because some children are put off by the adversarial competitive type of situation. And oh, the, some people might say, well, we're selecting the competitive, the whole point about competition is to select the best. But then I say, are we really selecting the best or are we just selecting the people who are the most aggressively adversarially competitive? And are they really the best? And I, I hope that many math teachers and math professors will recognize that often the, the people who think they're the best at math aren't really the best uh, in the end. And there are often students who are often female, but not always, who really don't think they're very good and think that they're not good enough, especially when they first get to university and they're surrounded by, by loud, very self-confident, students and they think oh I'm not good enough I, sh I shouldn't be a math major I'm not, not good enough and they're often the ones who are really good and mathematicians who are aware of their possible weaknesses do things like write much more careful proofs and check their work a lot rather than just sort of bombastically charging ahead and going oh yeah this is obviously true so I think that this that, um, I hope that what I wrote and what I theorized can help with many things at many levels, including in the end, maybe changing the whole of society for the better. Oh, wow. Uh, so th that, that, let's hope that works. It, it, one small thing I remember is uh, with regard to gender, there's, you know, you might have said this too, or wrote this, uh, that there's a much bigger difference within gender than there is between gender, right? So the gender isn't really, like you were saying, a, a good measure or a good uh, class, you might say. Right. And there, there are many people trying to study just exactly how big that difference is. And people often say, oh, well, there, there, there's more differences within gender. But there's one theory that, that people cling to who want to cling to inequality, which says that there's more variability among men than women. And so this, this is a sort of clever argument to get around that fact, saying, oh, well, the standard deviation is bigger for men. And so the tails, which is where the, the geniuses are, will be, there'll still be more men, even though the, the, the overlap is big, because we shouldn't be looking in the middle anyway. And the first thing I want to say is that these are, why are we even trying to make those arguments? I think it mostly it's to excuse our inaction around inequality and to make excuses so that we don't have to, to deal with it. Uh, but secondly, what are we even measuring when we measure those things? Because Mathematical ability is something that is very difficult to define and very difficult to measure. And any of the studies that measure it, they're typically measuring something that's not really complex. Because how do you measure something as complex as the ability to do research? And one analogy that has occurred to me recently is about running speed. Because you might think that running speed is something very measurable that you can definitely say the fastest men are definitely faster than the fastest women. And that's true in controlled circumstances for say a 100 meter sprint but it's interesting because recently women have been winning ultra marathons they beat men at ultra marathons and sometimes by quite a long a, a large margin and so i think that the test the tests that we can do for mathematical ability are a bit like testing 100 meter sprints and then expecting that result to apply to ultra marathon running 
because ultramarathons aren't just physiological achievements. It's a lot of psychological strategy and planning and endurance and uh, foresight and things like that. And a, a, a research as well isn't just about how fast you can multiply numbers together or whatever it is that people measure when they're, when they're measuring mathematical ability for those tests. It's so many things. It's about, it's about emotional aspects, psychological things, the environment that you're in and it, how much you can work through, see around things, create new situations, spot connections between situations. It's very, very complicated. And I think that trying to, trying to assess that and relate it to gender is so flawed because we'll never be able to measure it. And so how we could ever tell how much of it was, was innately biological as opposed to sociological is, uh, is it's impossible. We'll never be able to tell. Because for example, if, how can we tell that someone is, isn't worse at math just because they weren't encouraged enough? And so they haven't developed the, the they, they didn't get any further because people kept telling them they were no good at it. And those kinds of things are so difficult to separate out. I, I, and I think, well, why are we even trying to relate it to gender and study those things? And I think it's, it's in order to try and preserve the status quo instead of proceed. And I think that if we just look at behavior and separate that out, and I'm not saying we shouldn't ever think about gender, there are certainly I'm not saying we should be gender blind, that's what I mean, because there are types of bias that are very directly about gender. So if people are directly prejudiced in one way or another, then that is something that we do need to address directly. But I think that if we only address that and then not the issue of what characters and behaviors are good for mathematics, then we essentially what that does is it addresses diversity in the situation but it doesn't address inclusion because you can you could make a quota and you could just hire more women and many people would get angry about that because it would sound like reverse sexism but also it wouldn't it probably wouldn't help if you still had an environment that was not conducive to to those people and that was filled with people who thought that it was unfair that they had been hired, then they those people wouldn't flourish. And then you'd be just setting them up for a situation in which the, the point would sort of prove itself. And I do feel that my time as a tenured math professor ended up like that, that I didn't feel I could flourish. And it wasn't an environment in which I felt like I could do good mathematics. And I don't think that's because I'm a worse mathematician. I think it's because it was it was a non it was a non inclusive environment to me, and that's why I left. I didn't want to fight it anymore, and now I think I do much better work uh, outside of that system. And I have figured out because actually in that system, while I was in the normal academic career path, I really felt like I had to try and be ingressive to succeed because the environment was so ingressive, and it made me miserable. I didn't like it and I didn't like how I was becoming. And so I left and found a way that I could build a career that suited myself as a congressive person that I could, so that I could unlearn. I had learned a lot of ingressive behavior and I, I recognized that, but I wanted to unlearn it and learn how to operate congressively in the world. And I think that I am having a better impact on the world, I think, and helping more people and also I'm happier. Yeah, you're happier and you, and you get to be on uh, with Stephen Colbert too. So it, it works out for you. <laughs> works out in many ways. <laughs> so, uh, so thanks for explaining, talking about all these things, explaining them. Is there anything you, that we, you, uh, you'd still like to say that we missed? Um, no, I think it's been very interesting. Thank you very much for your interest. <laughs> Well, well, thank you for, for talking with you. I know you're very busy with, with your new book, and the new book is uh, X plus Y. It's a mathematician's manifesto for rethinking gender, and, and uh, Eugenia, oh, they, oh, you ha happen to have it with you. That's good. Uh, and, uh, and, and there you go. And then, uh, so relating to cooking, almost X plus Y is almost like apples plus oranges, uh, but uh, you, are, are you going to uh, bring them all together? Yes, and um, the point is that, that we don't have to try and compare apples with oranges, as the <laughs> saying goes, that apples are wonderful and oranges are also wonderful. <laughs>
All right. Well, thank you very much. And then I should mention your affiliation. You're the uh, scientist. Is it the or a scientist in residence? Um, I'm currently the scientist in residence, okay. but sometimes there is another one because actually it was a it was a one semester because it, it's usually a one semester position. But I liked being there so much, and fortunately, they liked me too. <laughs> and so I have stayed there for much longer than any other scientist in residence. Excellent. And they, maybe that's the School of the Art Institute of Chicago. Yes. All right. Uh, so, Eugenia, again, thanks very much, and good luck with the book or the books. Thank you. Thank you right. very much. Bye. Bye.